Hi girls, welcome to my podcast for chapter 5, Ancient Greece, and I'm going to be covering mostly Hellenistic Greek art in this podcast, though I think there's some still there's still some late classical Greek art that we didn't get to in class, so I may cover some of that as well. And um, after this podcast, I'll be making a test review podcast for your test this coming Tuesday, so please stay tuned for that timeline again um, so you can kind of get a sense of dates here. So do you remember what event marked the transition from the archaic period to the classical period? Well, hopefully you recall the Peloponnesian War. Remember how I talked about um, the city-state of Athens battling um, Persia, this great empire of the Near East led by Darius, this big scary tyrant who had conquered most of the Near East um, all the way through parts of modern day Turkey. So they invaded Athens and even though Athens was outnumbered, they eventually over many years overcame the Persians. So the defeat of the Persians marked that transition into the classical period. And so in your textbook, it says classical and high classical. So do you remember why we use the word high classical? I went over that in class. If you don't remember, then just check in your textbook. Um, so what characteristics do you remember uh, between archaic sculpture and classical sculpture? Here are your two examples. If, you, if you're having trouble remembering the characteristics between archaic sculpture and classical sculpture, remember we looked at these two dying warriors from the pediment of the Temple of Aphia in Greece. Uh, and they are they were made about a hundred years apart. So um, there is time separating them. And we can say that the sculpture on the top is a representative of archaic sculpture and the sculpture on the bottom is representative of classical sculpture. So what differences do you see? A great example. Um, hopefully you're able, able to identify both of these sculptures since they are part of the required images from the College Board. So on the left is the spear bear or Deriverus. Do you remember the sculptor? Polykletos. He's the one who came up with the canon um, where he believed that the human body should be eight heads high. And then on the right is the Anavisos Koros. Um, which is representative of archaic. So think about the differences between these two sculptures. We talked about it in class. Also note that the Deriferous is a marble copy, a Roman marble copy. So remember how I talked about um, the differences between a Roman marble copy and a Greek original sculpture. Hopefully you made note of that. Make sure you review that. I'm not sure if we looked at this Herm of Pericles. Uh, Pericles is important because he was somewhat of a tyrant. He was hated among many Athenians for wasting monies that they uh, that they acquired from winning the war on restoring the Athenian Acropolis. Okay, so he also was responsible for. Uh, the first democratic society, so that's also important. And let's take a look at his at his Acropolis that he restored. And if you have time, definitely watch this little video um, by Rick Steves. He's on the History Channel all the time, and he explores the world and makes little videos, and they're quite entertaining. So here's an aerial view of the Acropolis today, obviously in ruins. Here's a little reconstruction of the Acropolis. Okay, and again, this is what it looks like today. Uh, just a reminder that I will be showing Secrets of the Parthenon during lunch tomorrow. I have first lunch, so if you're able to come and watch it, you know, even if you can only watch like 20, 30 minutes of it, then I'll give you three points extra credit. Um, and if you don't have first lunch, then you can come after school and I'll show 20, 30 minutes of it and you can, you can still get the extra credit points. 
Here is a reconstructed drawing of what the Parthenon looked like at the time. So why is this building considered a mix of archaic and classical periods? I mean, it was made during the classical period, but what archaic elements does it have and what classical elements does it have? Think about that. Okay, note, not sure if we got to this or not in class, note the gigantic 40-foot statue of Athena in the central portion of the temple. What is that central portion called? The cella, good. Um, and what else do I want to say about this? Here's your um, plan, okay? So you can see that it is a peripteral, or I'm sorry, dipteral temple in that it has an outer layer of Doric columns followed by an inner layer of Ionic columns. Here would be the cella. Here would be where the Athena Parthenos statue would be. And then notice all of the friezes. Gigantomachy, the birth of Athena is in this pediment. Um, the contest between Athena and Poseidon is in this pediment. So there is relief carvings all throughout the inside of this temple. And we talked about one in particular in class, the Panathenaic processional frieze. And why did I say that was important? What was so remarkable about that frieze? Here's a reproduction of the gigantic statue of Athena. It would have been about 38 feet tall, made of gold and ivory. So very, very, very costly. And this, you know, really reinforces the idea of the Parthenon and the Acropolis itself as a symbol of Greek pride, of Greek power, of Pericles wanting the rest of the world to know how prosperous and powerful the Athenians were. It was really symbolic of that. Panathenaic festival procession frees inside the Parthenon. And I'll just remind you why it's so important. It's important because it is not depicting gods and goddesses like most temple friezes would and most pediment sculpture would. It is depicting the Athenian people themselves. Uh, and it's depicting a festival that would happen in Athens every four years to just celebrate the city and celebrate the people of Athens. Um, and just as a reminder, it was once painted. Do you remember the name or the term for the paint, the pigment mixed with wax that would have been used to paint this relief sculpture and paint the outside of the temples? Okay, it's encaustic. Um, so this is, like I said, this is on the inside of the Parthenon, very important relief sculpture. And this is a college board favorite. It's been on a number of exams in the past. Um, but I also want to show you these figures. Of course, they're headless and armless. Um, this is not, is not how they would have been originally. But the important thing here is the drapery. And I think this depiction of drapery is just quite beautiful. And how is this drapery, compare this to say, one of the early cores that we, looked, that we looked at. And let me go back to it here. Okay, so this peplos core, look at her drapery, look at how it, it basically conceals her body. She almost looks like a column. We really can't see her legs at all. We can barely see the outline of her chest. It is very much concealing her body. So if you compare that to the sculptures that I just showed you from the Parthenon, you can see a huge, huge, huge difference. And actually what we call this is the wet drapery effect. Um, <laughs> some art history professors call it uh, the original wet t-shirt contest, which is kind of funny. But basically the Greeks, as I said, they celebrated the human body. They thought the human body was beautiful. And although they rarely showed women in the nude, later on we will see some nude goddesses, um, they do start showing them with this clingy, wet drapery that is just enhancing the body and actually revealing more than it is concealing. Okay, and then here is the Propylaea or the entryway to the Acropolis. You do need to know all of the buildings in the Acropolis. They are required images. 
Um, and this was also believed to be one of the first art galleries. So that's also important. Um, and this is, just like the Parthenon, is a mix of Doric columns on the outside and Ionic columns on the inside. This is the Erechtheion. Um, and the most important thing or the most notable aspect of the Erechtheion is its porch, the south porch. This was on your quiz with the female columns. They're columns, but they're shaped like a female statue. And those are called caryatids. Here it is. So this is from the south porch of the Erechtheion. The Erechtheion was a temple. It was a temple dedicated to many different gods, but um, it had slender Ionic columns on one side, and then on the south porch it had these uh, caryatids. Uh, there are also male columns, not anywhere in the Acropolis, but we saw male columns at the Temple of Ramses in Egypt. And then this above image here, this is from Mexico. So those are called Atlantids, Atlantids. Those are when male figures are used as a column. Uh, another really beautiful image from the, from the Acropolis is the is Nike adjusting her sandal. And this is in the temple of Athena Nike, which is a very small temple inside of the Acropolis. And actually here's an image of it. Okay, so it's very, very tiny. You can see ionic columns on the outside. There would have been a very pretty decorative painted frieze going around the outside of the building. And then, like I said, inside you have this beautiful image of the goddess Nike adjusting her sandal. And this is another great example of the drapery emphasizing the body, clinging to the body, showing the body, rather than concealing the body like we saw in the, in the ancient Korai. Moving into the late classical period, the late classical period is about uh, from 404 BCE to 323 BCE, and then after that is the Hellenistic period. So this is kind of when um, Greek history starts to, um, bad things begin to happen. So uh, the area of Macedon north of Greece uh, begins to gain power, um, and this guy Philip invades Greece, um, and then he's eventually taken over by Alexander the Great. Um, so there's still this focus on individualism and focus on the self, but there are more immigrants because the, the area of Greece is, is expanding. So there are more people from the outside world coming in to live, to live in Greece. So you see um, different ethnicities and it's more of a cosmopolitan area now. It's more of like an urban feel. There's lots of you know people from different parts of the world living in Greece. A good representation of the late classical period would be this sculpt sculpture by Praxiteles. He's another sculptor who I want you to know about and he was known for making the skin of his sculptures look very real and fleshy and soft. And, um, and so this sculpture is obviously very notable because the woman is nude. I mean, hopefully you noticed that right away. Um, people came from everywhere to see this sculpture because it was the first nude depiction of a goddess that people had really seen. So it was quite shocking, it was erotic in a sense, and it was certainly a break from the past. Um, so the name of this is Aphrodite of Nidos, and she is she's about to get in the bath. That's what's happening here. But you still see the classically aloof face, the very, the very idealized body, but it's more realistic looking and it's very sensual in nature. Um, here's another late classical sculpture. Um, this is the head of Heracles, and this is by the sculptor Scopas. He's the third guy that I want you to know. And he was really known for his intense emotional portrayals in, in sculpture. This, um, portrays the great Greek hero Heracles, who is well known, um, wearing the lion skin on his head. You can see the teeth there. Um, and the face has eroded away for the most part, but it does contain the deep set eyes and the in intense emotion, as it says here, deep set eyes and psychological tension. So make note of Scopas, um, Praxiteles, and uh, 
sorry, and Lysippos. He's the third guy I want you to know. But I'm running out of time, so I'll see you in my next podcast.